Last question. Why is there something instead of nothing? <laughs> Ten words or less. <laughs> Just because. So I got to do this in haiku then. Okay. Um, okay, five, seven, five. <laughs> uh, words that make questions. <laughs> may not be questions at all. <laughs> I am well reviewed. Neil deGrasse Tyson, it is an honor to have you here and an honor always to talk to you. Please, come on, get up for Neil deGrasse Tyson. What we talked about on the panel last week, we debated global warming. Two of the people did not believe in it. Oh, no, one person didn't believe it. Two of them didn't believe in evolution. Uh, <laughs> you know, the good thing about science is that it's true whether or not you believe in it. You see, that's the... It's free. Anyway. Um, I read a book, Constellation of Philosophy. The main guy, Boethius, is condemned to death. He has everything taken from him. All he has is his reason and his sense of self. Not even that. But he attempts to console himself to this execution by reasoning that the world has order, that there is something that keeps things together. And he uses his reason to try and get to the root of why he should be at peace at death. The problem is, his source of origin is a belief in God. What would you do? Well, I, I don't know if I fully understand the question. I do know that uh, if he's about to be executed... Uh, How about you are about to be executed? Oh, I'm about to be executed. You have nothing except your knowledge and your, your knowledge of science, your experience. I would request that my body in death be buried, not cremated, so that the energy content contained within it gets returned to the earth so that flora and fauna can dine upon it just as I have dined upon flora and fauna throughout my life. What I don't understand is why, I, as an educator, I care about the population and the electorate and all this attention going to complain about Donald Trump. You're not really complaining about Donald Trump. You're complaining that there is a major portion of the electorate who likes him. And so they are your actual right. object of your, of your ire. Agree. Okay, if they're the object of your ire, then shouldn't you be looking at the educational system that'll, that somehow allows people yeah. to, to not think about data? and not think about what is and is not true in this world. Isn't that where the focus and by should be? The way, just, you, you can knock Trump out of the contest and the population who supports it will just wait for the next one to rise up and you have to beat the next one over the and head. And even on top of the education, it's what are those issues? Because community forms around shared problems. So what are the issues those people that have formed around Trump, what are their problems and how do we help them? Like honestly, you gotta try to help everybody. I think you must realize that some people are going to go to your show at the planetarium and they're going to say, aha, those scientists have discovered God because God, dark matter, is what holds this universe together. Was that a question? <laughs> it's a statement. You know, you know they're going to so, say that. So the history of discovery particularly cosmic discovery, but discovery in general, scientific discovery, is one where at any given moment there's a frontier. And there tends to be an urge for people, especially religious people, to assert that across that boundary into the unknown lies the handiwork of God. This shows up a lot. Newton even said it. He had his laws of gravity and motion, and he was explaining the moon and the planet. He was there. He doesn't mention God for any of that. And then he gets to the limits of what his equations can calculate. So I don't, can't quite figure this out.
Maybe God steps in and makes it right every now and then. That's, that's where he invoked God. And, the, and Ptolemy, he, 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 he bet on the wrong horse, but he was a brilliant guy. He formulated the geocentric universe with Earth in the middle. This is where we got epicycles and all these, right. all this, the machinations of the heavens. There was still a mystery to him. He, he looked up and uttered the following words. I, when I trace at my pleasure the windings to and fro of the heavenly bodies. These are the planets going through retrograde and back. The mysteries of the earth. When I trace at my pleasure the windings to and fro of the heavenly bodies, I no longer touch earth with my feet. I stand in the presence of Zeus himself and take my fill of ambrosia. What he did was invoke, he didn't invoke Zeus to account for the rock that he's standing on or the air he's breathing. It was this point of mystery and in gets invoked God. This, over time, has been described by philosophers as the God of the gaps. Mm -hmm. if, if that's how you, if that's where you're going to put your God, in this world, then God is an ever receding pocket of scientific ignorance. If that's how you're going to invoke God, if God is the mystery of the universe, these mysteries, we're, t we're tackling these mysteries one by one. If you're going to stay religious at the end of the conversation, God has to be more to you than just where science has yet to tread. So to the person who says, maybe dark matter is God, if the only reason why you're saying it's because it's a mystery, then get ready to have that undone. So you're worried that you will die before aliens come visit you. <laughs> okay, there are hallucinogenic drugs that can solve that problem. <laughs> and your brain won't know the difference. Uh, so, if you, so here's, here's the thing. If you want to communicate uh, with intelligent aliens, across the gaps of space. Uh, you would use things that move at the speed of light. Radio waves have good sort of penetration properties of interstellar gas clouds and this sort of thing. All right, so now let's find a planet and send a radio signal. Well, that radio signal is gonna have to arrive there at a time where they have not only intelligence, but technology. Suppose some other civilization was sending us radio waves and it arrived 200 years ago. Presumably, we would have counted ourselves among the ranks of intelligent creatures in the universe at that time, but we would have had no capacity to receive radio waves because radio waves weren't discovered yet. And so, in fact, if you want to communicate with a civilization, it has to be right in the slice of time where, they, where the life on that planet achieved intel complexity and intelligence and technology. And maybe technology is not a forever thing. Maybe technology escalates to the point where it becomes so dangerous that they render themselves extinct. So perhaps there's only a narrow window over which you could actually have a radio wave conversation with aliens. So I think the only hope, really, is that we get visited by highly intelligent aliens that figured out a way to cross the gaps of space time uh, but thereby not being limited by the, the speed of light as a, as a speed limit of the universe. As we say, speed of light is not just a good idea, it's the law. But <laughs> if, if you warp space-time, you can cheat that, as they do in Star Trek with their warp drives and things. So uh, if they, they would visit us. Now, here's, now, you were depressed before. You, you don't know depression until what I'm about to tell you. So now imagine if they visit us in a spacecraft. What are we doing now? We, in the United States, we don't even have a spacecraft to launch our own astronauts. We're hitching a ride with the, we're buying seats on the Russian for tens of millions of dollars, okay? And what will that do? It will go into low Earth orbit where we will boldly go where hundreds have gone before, all right? That is the state of human space exploration at this moment. Now aliens come from the gaps of space and they land, okay? I have two hypotheses, three. One of them is they have already landed, but they accidentally arrived during Comic-Con. And, <laughs> and no one could distinguish them from any other costumes that were being worn. And then they left because no one cared that they came. So that's, 
It's a remote, le a remote possibility, <laughs> but I'm, I'm allowing that in the probability of this. All right, so another possibility is that they took a good look at us and concluded there's no sign of intelligent life on Earth, <laughs> not worthy of their attention. A third possibility, there may be more, but these are the three that I carry with me, is that they are so much smarter than we are. And by the way, what would that take? Not much. But what's the next closest animal to humans in intelligence? Chimpanzees, chips. And what's the DNA difference? 2% tops? Yet, what's the, they, what's the most they can do? They can stack boxes and reach a banana? Okay, maybe they'll put up an umbrella, rudimentary sign language, maybe. Our toddlers do that. Our toddlers. So here's a, only a 2% difference in DNA and the chimp is stacking boxes, but we have poetry and music and the Hubble telescope. So our hubris ends up saying, what a difference that 2% makes. What a difference that makes. Maybe that difference is just as small as the 2%. Maybe the difference between the Hubble telescope and stacking boxes is as small as the 2% indicates. Because now consider some other species, 2% beyond us, just as we are 2% beyond the chimp. What would we look like to them? They would roll the smartest human for Stephen Hawking, roll him forward and say, this one is slightly smarter than the rest because he can do astrophysics calculations in his head, like little Timmy over here who just came back from preschool. <laughs> Alien Timmy, oh look, you just composed your 12th sonnet. That's beautiful. Oh, you just re-derived the fundamental principles of calculus. Let's put it on the refrigerator door. Yes, that's what their toddlers would be doing because our toddlers do what the smartest chimps do. If aliens came and they had only that much more intelligence than us, the gap that is between us and chimps, and we have DNA in common, if they were only that, they could enslave the entire Earth, and we wouldn't even know it. <laughs> Maybe that has already happened. <laughs> and we are living our lives as though we are expressing the free will of the human species, yet we are nothing more than an ant farm <laughs> on their shelf. So we are their entertainment, not even worthy of investigation beyond what we look like through in their terrarium. Yeah. Speaking of Earth, what, how do you feel about the people that think it's only 6,000 years old? Uh, it's, they, they, if they think that, they think that because that is mandated by their religious philosophy. Exactly. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, just keep it out of the science classroom. That, that's all. I, I don't try to confuse that with doing science. Mm. Science, we have learned. Science has completely transformed our culture. It's doubled our life expectancy. It has brought comfort and uh, health and well-being. And, and not only science, but the fruits of science, the technological fruits oh, yeah. of science. And, of course, you need to be good shepherds of this power because in the wrong hands, it could be used for evil. All right? This is the great sort of dichotomy of great the great... Uh, of unlocking the secrets of nature. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I don't. I'm not going to fight them to tell them the universe is not. Just 6, stay out of your years. way. No, 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 not my. Just the science classroom. Right. No, no, and 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 if you want to put it in the science classroom, understand the ramifications. Right. Mm. Your country will go bankrupt because you will no longer be in a position to forge the economies of tomorrow that will require uh, science and technological innovation. And at least the next question, because a few people on the lines are asking, do you believe in God? I, I, I'm not convinced. If, if, here, here's the thing. If every, every time I talk about God with someone who's a believer, God is, is, is all-powerful and all-knowing and, and, and all-good, right? The, the good is a big part of this. Mm -hmm. And then I look at, all the ways Earth wants to kill us. <laughs> Strike uh, you know, a tsunami takes out a quarter million people, hurricanes, earthquakes, tornadoes, floods. And, and I add all of that up. Either the God is not all powerful or is not all good. <laughs> yeah. But it can't really be both given all the ways the universe wants to kill us. And, and, and if Earth is not 
uh, uh, finish killing you. There's the asteroid that could come in. Right. An mm. asteroid rendered 70% of all life forms extinct back in uh, the, the famous one in 65 million years ago that took out the dinosaurs. So there's so many ways to die, not at the hands of someone else who has free will, mm -hmm. that I, I don't know what what is the nature of the God that you're talking about? I, I, I got to like try to like use your logic back at you. Uh -huh. But don't we define what, what is good and what is bad? So we see a tsunami wipe out a whole bunch of people. And we're, we're as human beings going, wow, that's bad because we define what bad is. Maybe in God's brain, eyes, whatever the hell, that, that's not bad. Well, but except you defined what God is. Oh, boy. Wow. Now that's, you did it. That's so why, why do you have the power to define who and what God is, right. but not have the power to define what good is. Yeah, my point is we, we just don't know it all. Not even oh, close. Oh, 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 sure. So, so therefore, uh, if you're going to say God actually is good and a quarter million people dying from an earthquake and a tsunami and, and other natural disasters, right. um, and God presumably has control over that and God is good, then we have to then say God works in mysterious ways, right? <laughs> so there that, you go. That's the, but people only say that when their understanding of God fails them. When right? it's a, something bad. No, no, when they can't <laughs> understand it, they say, well, God works in mysterious right, right, ways. Right, but yeah, somehow, in these other ways, you did understand him. Right. How are you saying, well, this is the, this is the handiwork of God. Is you're doing God's work. God wants you to do this. Somehow you know God's motives every other way. Mm -hmm. when, but when a quarter million people get wiped out, God works in mysterious ways. Mm -hmm. why, do you, why, why do you even claim to have access to God's mind in some contexts and not others. Yeah, exactly. Just admit you have no clue right. and get on with life. That's how I look at it. We just don't have a, a clue when it comes down to it. Well, I'd like to think that preserving being... health and longevity, that is a nice operational definition of something that's good. Right. How can you argue? Why, how can you debate something that keeps you alive and healthy? That's got to be a something that's good. I, mm -hmm. I can't. I'm, I'm, I refuse to allow someone to say I'm going to give you cancer, birth defects, and shorten your life, and somehow call that good. I, I, I'm not <laughs> yeah. going. There. Oh, I hear you. I hear I, you. I, I'm not going there.